Um, I think uh, I wanted first to, on behalf of the organizers, uh, I would like uh, to welcome all of you uh, to the 61st annual Illinois Bituminous Paving Conference. The first uh, video conference, I think, <laughs> for 61 years, this conference has been serving as a forum for the professionals and academics involved in asphalt construction to come and share knowledge and know-how and expertise they have gained along the years. We have this year, uh, I think more than 240 professionals attending uh, this event. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, again, my name is Imad al -Qadi. I'm the Bliss Professor of Engineering here in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at the University of Illinois at the Urbana-Champaign and the Director of the Illinois Center for Transportation. And I will serve as the conference chair. I would like to thank uh, the Illinois Department of Transportation Acting Secretary, Mr. Omer Osman, and the FHW, FHWA Illinois Division Administrator, Arlene Cocker, and Tollway Chief Engineer, Paul Kovacs, for attending and taking part in this event. I also would like to thank all our speakers for being part of this event and the moderators who will introduce them properly later on. I also would like to thank the awards committee for diligent and hard, and hard work, and of course, the moderators of this conference session. This year program covers many areas from modified binder to pavement assessment and performance and explores flexible pavements advancements. Each question or each presentation will be followed by question and answers. If you have a question to any of the speakers, you may raise your hand to ask the question directly or write your questions in the chat or question and answer. And one of our PhD students will be there ready to uh, read the question to, to the speaker. Uh, following the conference, uh, you can uh, find all the presentations in our Bituminous Conference website. You will also receive an electronic survey tomorrow. And I would appreciate if you could please take the time to provide us with your valued comments and suggestions for the next year. Usually we take all these comments here and respond to you. As you can see in the screen here, these are the different methods that you can ask a question. So I want just to emphasize that if you raise your hand, this means that you want to ask the question verbally. And after you're done, please lower your, your hand. And if you wanted just to ask the question or have us ask the question on your behalf, please uh, just put it on the chat, which means that everybody will be seeing your question or you can use the question and answer, which means that we will read the question on, on your behalf. Um, finally, I wanted to thank our sponsors and uh, exhibitors for their support. And during the break, uh, we are placing their names as well as the videos for the exhibitors. It's a little different way than uh, what we have been done, but it seems that it has been working really well. And also I wanted to thank our staff and students uh, for all their help and support, especially Nawal. I think she has been uh, running the show uh, really efficiently and effectively. So thank you so much. Uh, with that, I think, uh, I, I wish you all a good conference. I uh, will be moderating uh, the first session here. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, uh, Acting Secretary uh, Omer Usman. Uh, his role as an I, I, uh, IDOT's secretary reflects three decades of engineering and management experience, which means that he is older than me. His vast experience in transportation includes <laughs> advancing complex projects and assisting uh, resources to inform funding and programmatic uh, needs to create multimodal system that supports economic development and travel for Illinois residents. Uh, he is a Sudan native and he studied civil engineering at Southern University and a and College before earning uh, his master's degree from Bradley University. 
I think we have seen a lot of uh, good work and changes since him taking office. And it's uh, a true pleasure to have him uh, kick off the conference. So Secretary Usman, the floor is yours. Well, good morning and good morning, everyone. And, and thank you, Dr. Kadi, for, uh, for that wonderful introduction. I just wanna say that uh, and as far as the age is concerned, you just happen to have more hair, that's all. Uh, <laughs> but I, you, you, are, you are definitely older than me. I, so I it, it's good to see you. It yep. is good to be here, good to be here, especially with, uh, with, with the industry partner, with the engineers, technician, people who are in the asphalt business. It's, it's nice to be talking to all of you this morning. So um, this is perhaps about the third or fourth uh, Zoom conference call I had in the last two or three, uh, three months. But I get to say, I typically start by talking about COVID and, and what it did to us, uh, particularly as a department. Obviously, we are all dealing, um, dealing with, with COVID in, a, in our own various ways, but it was, I gotta say, COVID impacted us in all facets. There is not an office, there is not a section or a unit within a department that did not get impacted by the, by the pandemic. Um, but we managed to adjust, we managed to redirect our mission, uh, we managed to redirect our focus. Uh, it was rough, it was really rough at time, uh, early on, uh, especially for a public, let's admit it, for a public agency like us with our outdated um, you know, uh, softwares, with our outdated uh, uh, even hardware. But um, I think your staff uh, have done a, a great job uh, in, in, in making sure all the essentials, everything that we needed, the IT staff that is, uh, was put out there for our staff to continue the work. Uh, but what made it really happen is the designation from our good governor that transportation is essential. If transportation was not designated as an essential surface, I think we would have been uh, uh, in a di different situation now, but that designation is what uh, and, and, and the de designation, obviously, from, uh, from the federal authorities, what um, kind of pushed us into up in our game, so to speak. So I was very proud of, of how things, um, you know, turn out to be, uh, despite that initial uh, shock uh, to our system. But our maintainers, I think, did a great job. Our technical staff uh, working from home. Uh, continue that operation, continue uh, delivering on, on, on project, on the phase one, phase two, uh, putting projects to let in, consult, uh, selecting consultant, that kind of essential work um, had continued unabated. Um, but I'm very proud of our maintainers. I'm very proud of our bridge crews who are out, who are out there um, in inspecting our bridges, making sure uh, things are, 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 are in a good shape and as far as that, if you guys recall, it seems like uh, decades ago, but if you guys recall that initial uh, late March and, you know, and, and, and the lack of groceries, lack of uh, uh, medical um, uh, or medicine at the pharmacies and how we as a nation are gonna be able to deliver uh, the essentials uh, to, uh, to, to, to the population. So our job was to make sure our infrastructure was in a good shape for the freight uh, the essential freight to make it to to their intended designation. So I think we have done a great job in in, in that in that regard as a department, uh, as transportation leader, including our engineers, including our consultant, including and I know Paul is on, uh, and 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 thank you, Arlene, if you are hearing me. Uh, you you guys have been a great partner to us, helping us out with that initial. You know how to absorb that initial shock. Uh, but having said that, our material side was no different. Um, uh, our, work, our people really, really worked really hard on the material. And I'm especially proud to talk a little bit about the IFIT and, and the crack performance test that is, we are going to be able to, um, to utilize on our HMA projects in 2020 and beyond. And I know our team is gonna be presenting more detail of that but and we are also on top of that we are also uh, wrapping up 
the ICT research, uh, research project that will result in, in, in a performance testing uh, criteria for liquid asphalt. And that's a great research for us. And, 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 and we know uh, through our partner with ICT and the various research we are carrying through, that is just making us a leader in the industry nationwide, not just Midwest, not just in Illinois, but we are, um, we are now recognized as a leader in the industry when it comes to research, especially on the asphalt and especially on the material side. So, but one other commitment I have made to my staff and I'm, I'm making right now is that work is gonna continue. The commitment from IDAT is we're still gonna continue with the industry, with the university and, and with, uh, with uh, your VI partner, the ICT um, uh, partners, we're gonna continue to work uh, together. Any research that comes up, uh, we're gonna discuss all these research and, and, then, uh, and, the, and this, not only the schedule, the priority of those research through our executive committee, um, and Dr. Gotti is, 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 is a spearheading with our, with our staff. I think that's a great setup uh, for us on how we, how we are handling our research for down the road for years to come. Uh, and I know um, Kelly Morris will be presenting an update on our research. Um, one other item I wanted to allude to is uh, our partner in FHWA uh, they have conducted some virtual visit with our, uh, with our uh, staff in Bureau of Materials at the, uh, uh, and District 6. And obviously the professor was involved in it. IAPA was involved in it. And, and their sole purpose was how you know, the, um, the, what is going on and how is IDOT is going to be implementing the IFIT. Uh, not only the IFIT, but also our balanced mixed design approach that you're probably gonna be hearing about in, in the next couple of days. Um, I would like, at, at, at this point, I'd like to thank Lakeman College and their partner for being quick react to pandemic. They have developed the online courses material and delivered several HML level when an aggregate course, obviously using Zoom, for the lab demonstration and for the practical exam. You know, the, the continuity of, 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 of actually having those HML level and aggregate courses, we can't do without it. If you, if you have been involved in the industry for a while, and a lot of you have been, uh, you know how essential those, uh, uh, those classes are for us and for our industry. Um, so having said that, let's talk just a little bit about, um, and there's a lot of other things going on, obviously, that you're gonna hear about, including our pavement preservation program, pavement preservation strategy, what the department is doing in that regard, uh, HMA uh, lift thickness, and how we are, how we are uh, trying to redefine that uh, with the point of, uh, first of all, achieving quality, uh, by, and by extension, that means um, long lasting um, a product out there. And that's what the department uh, and all of us in the industry are after. So there's, there's quite the work going on there. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about safety and specifically we, we, have, not, we have not had a good year when it comes to uh, fatalities. We have passed a thousand death already. Uh, for the last three years or so, we have been lucky, and I don't know if that's the right word to say lucky. We have had under a thousand fatality on a annual basis. Obviously, one fatality is one, uh, is one too many, uh, as far as uh, I am and the department is concerned. But we already have had um, uh, past the, the thousand uh, fatality, and we still have this winter coming up. We still have the rest of December to go, and those numbers um, are going to increase. And that is a worrisome for me. And, and, and one aspect of, of those fatalities is a lot of them did happen or did take place uh, within our work zone. 
And that was noticeable to us. We have had uh, some good discussion with FHWA, some good discussion internally of how can we change course? Uh, our, uh, our construction um, is not gonna slow down. And that's a byproduct of, uh, of our uh, rebuilt Illinois Capitol bill. I don't think we're gonna slow down um, uh, that much. So we're gonna have a lot of construction zone. Uh, so my ask, if I have any, is uh, out of all of you, is obviously to spread the word. Um, talk to your neighbors, uh, talk to your coworkers, talk to whoever, your friends, um, that this is on top of the pandemic, having more than a thousand fatalities, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a good thing for us. So if we could slow it down, if you could help us out, just by just talking to, um, to people you know, uh, we, we would appreciate that. And I think if we have no noticed that nationwide, the increase in fatality is a byproduct of uh, the slowdown in traffic. I, we have seen it early on where we had a 40% decline and, and progressively, you know, 30, 20% decline in the traffic value. So that was, you know, it led people to speech and it speed unnecessarily. Uh, once they once they saw the open area and and and, and that's what what essentially um, um, get us to this point of uh, of having more than more than a thousand fatalities. Let's talk a little bit about rebuilt Illinois. Um, obviously, we we are going to through physical year 2020, and I think we uh, we are doing a good job so far. And as far as um, um, the product we are putting out there, and typically the product um, is not only the work behind the scene in the phase one and phase two, but the product that people see is actually the contracts um, that they see across the state. We slowed down just a tad, obviously because of the pandemic, but not by much. There's a little bit of a decline in revenue um, that if we're gonna feel, um, we're gonna feel that as we go along in the next couple of years, where we're not deleting projects, from our multi-year program, however, we delay in some of them. Meaning a six-year program might wind up being a seven or eight or a nine-year program. So the time frame is gonna expand a little, but the projects, we are still committed to the projects we have put out there in October of 2019. That's the initial rebuild Illinois program. Um, I think we're doing a good job considering, and, and that is a testament to ingenuity of the IDOT staff um, uh, uh, throughout all, all nine districts, and obviously our partners in ACEC and, uh, and, 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 and the contracting industry and, and transportation in, in industry in general. Um, I think we're going to see it, we, the last one we did in 2021, that's the multi year program, was a little bit over um, a $3 billion. Uh, we're going to, uh, I don't think. We're going to see us slowing down just a little bit in as far as are we going to deliver the entire three billion and, and, and part of it is what took place earlier on with the pandemic. If it, uh, what I've been saying is, especially in the Cook County area, in the District 1 area, all the all the court systems shut down and a lot of the projects, especially in an urbanized setting. Um, require some sort of a right away condemnation. So if we don't get the right away and clear right away on any given project, that project doesn't go to letting. So a lot of the project get held back, meaning some of those projects, uh, we're gonna try still on deliver them uh, throughout this fiscal year. However, if we don't get there, naturally they're gonna go into 2021. When it, uh, 2022 rather, uh, uh, fiscal year. And I do expect um, the same, perhaps uh, 2022 value of a little bit over $3 billion uh, worth of program. So that's as far as the rebuilt Illinois. Um, I'm very fond of saying that rebuilt Illinois obviously um, is the largest one, largest capital bill we ever had in the, uh, in, 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 in our IDOT history. And it's unique in that it's impacting each and every facet of what the department does. It's not just majority of it, obviously, is going to uh, roadways and bridges, but it does impact our rail, 
it doesn't back our transit system, uh, all the multimodal system, we get port, a port section to it, aeronautic to it. It does impact each and every um, um, local partner, local agency partner we work with. So we are grateful for that. We are grateful for the governor for leading that. And, and we are uh, uh, really grateful for all, uh, all the good legislators who actually voted for it. It's not easy to vote for a tax increase, but a majority of them recognize the actual need and, and, and that's uh, to their credit. And we are very, very appreciative of that. Um, one project I wanted to allude to, and, and there are great projects that are part, uh, you know, statewide that are part of uh, um, RBI, including the I-80, including the Kennedy Expressway at the I-270, and a host of large projects, but one project that is close to you guys, uh, close to your vice Champagne, is a good project that we just already started uh, on I-7457 interchange. That whole area is going to change. There's a couple of bridge projects, overhead projects. We already have it started. You can see it driving through. But the majority of it is yet to come. That's close to, two, uh, collectively, it's close to $200 million worth of, uh, of, of, of a complete rehab, complete change of that entire interchange, which is outdated. It doesn't meet any current standard. I said I-74 is going to benefit heading heading to the east and west, and obviously I-57 itself. There's going to be some auxiliary land and 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 multiple multiple um, overhead, uh, basically removal and replacement, and that's going to be a great project that we all should be proud of. And hopefully when we start doing the uh, THE and we, when we start meeting face to face, um, everybody could uh, take a good look at that and appreciate it for years to come. With that, um, I, I probably spoke way too, way too long. And uh, there's probably a lot, I didn't say that. If there are any questions that you think I could answer right, right now or wait until everybody's done, you could uh, take it from there, Dr. Cardi. Uh, thank you so much. This is very enlightening and informative. Thank you, Secretary Osman. And now we are uh, taking questions. Again, there is three methods to ask, to ask the question, either through the chat and we will read the question or question and answers. And we will read the question or raise your hand. And uh, we definitely uh, have you join the group and ask the question verbally. So let's see if uh, we have any questions here. We'll give them two seconds. And if not, Arlene, she will ask you the question. <laughs> I'm expecting that. Uh, I think they are, they're maybe a little shy. Let's see. Uh, I have a quick question for you, Secretary. Um, during COVID-19, yes. how is the operation itself was for the IDOT personnel, especially the people in the field? I mean, I've been to the field, I work with some, but right. general, management of such a big group of people is a challenge. So can you share with us a little bit about how you manage this and how we're gonna be returning to the norm in a few months? All right. Well, a couple of things there you know, now, now that you think back about what took place, a couple of things that were really helpful. Uh, when you talk about people in the field, that means to me our operations people, our maintenance staff, and our construction staff. I think on the construction side, is, it, you know, it, it is safe to say that it wasn't an IDOT mission only. It was IDOT, it was the industry. And it was the trades so they collectively get together and they started talking about, and at the time, this was the unknown. How are you going to handle a situation? How are you going to handle a positive? Are you going to shut down the project? Who's, who's going to shut down the project? You know, how are you going to take care of your PPE? What if you don't have enough PPEs? Uh, you know, what do you need out in the field? All those issues were critical issues. Um, now it's the norm because we all have PPEs. We all have hand sanitizer. We all know what we did, but at the time it was very critical for us to get together 
Uh, it was led by the industry and the trades with, with us joining and, and that's to their credit. We wanted to make sure we don't stop. We wanted to make sure uh, construction keeps on going. We wanted to make sure obviously the letting and the letting, uh, you know, and, and the letting that makes the con annual construction program keeps on coming through too. So that was good to see. Now, internally on the department side, uh, you know, our focus was on our highway maintainers still because we need them out in the field. And as I said, they have been designated as essential and they can't, you know, their, their type of work is not something that you could do from home. And we have over 120, uh, over 130, what you'd call maintenance yards throughout the 102 counties we have in the state of Illinois. So our initial, our step one, so to speak, was just to ensure that everyone and each and every yard have what they need, uh, you know, as far as the essential, the hand sanitizers, the mask, which was a problem for us uh, early on, and so they could operate. And, and then it, and we needed to shift gear actually of not allowing even our own staff to go to the yard or to go to the coffee room within a yard or to, you know, drive to your yard location and then, um, and then, you know, get on in, in the IDOT track. Don't go inside the building. That kind of, uh, um, you know, step-by-step -step procedure is what we have employed. As you could tell, despite that, we still have, just like everybody else, we still have a lot of COVID um, uh, positive. A majority of them were coming out of the, uh, our highway maintainer um, ranks. But as soon as there was a uh, there was a COVID, obviously we took the initiative of shutting down a yard, uh, doing the uh, entire disinfecting the entire building, uh, isolating people, uh, asking people to quarantine, and for quite a while, you know, through June, July, August, we were uh, in good shape, just like what we're seeing around the state. We see a little bit of an uptick in, in a positive uh, number we we see within the department. So uh, that's it. I, I think that's yep. that's the background yep. I'm 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 going I'm willing to offer now. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Angeli. I think we yep. have some questions here. Sure. Please. There is a question, Secretary, in the chat. How much the de the decrease in travel during the month of April and March has affected the gas tax revenues, which contribute to the Rebuild Illinois program funding? And the question, particularly, is can this cause a reduction in the number of future lettings? Right, and that's and that's a great question. Um, I could tell you the decline in traffic initially was around the forty percent, and and the assumption is always if, if there's a forty percent decline, there's a forty uh, in traffic, there's a forty percent decline in revenue, and that was and that's not uh, a true statement. We have seen by and large, if you if from the initial steep decline, progressively traffic started coming back up. Then we started seeing the twelve. Uh, the 15% decline in traffic. But if you look at it collectively, we have lost anywhere between 17 to 20% of our revenue. I'll, I'm, and, I'm, and I'll say 17, um, I think it's a good number. That translated, not including this last month, not included November, I think that translated to around 130 around 100, uh, close to $140 million loss in revenue. This is on the motor fuel tax side. We did not experience um, that much of a decline when it comes to um, uh, vehicle registration. Uh, uh, as you know, people who still were able to register through the website uh, with, the, with the Secretary of State to get their sticker. And that 50, uh, you know, that 151, uh, that hundred fifty one dollars majority of it goes to uh, goes to transportation. We haven't we have seen some decline, but not by much. Having said that, I'm going to repeat that we're not eliminating projects from our multi year program. We are shifting them to the uh, you know if if they're not ready, everything we do on at any given point in time must be based on actual revenue. So we'll look at what's in the bank, what's in our checking account, so to speak. And we start, you know, putting our projects out there. 
based on what we see and what we could uh, reasonably invest. Have we seen a decline in 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 uh, in, uh, in number of projects on flooding? Yeah, to a certain extent, but. Uh, but not by much on the number of projects. I think we still have decent uh, number of uh, of projects on flooding. District one area took a hit. Majority of it was on the right of way uh, side. The cash flow is not is not bad today. If we look at our internal cash flow, but some of the project, you know, as you assess the impact of this 130, 140, and and. Obviously, we still see some of the decline to have you assess it and spread that across the entire multi-year program. Uh, we're going to see the impact for years to, uh, for for years to come, I think, on this decline. And we are hoping, the, uh, you know, with the stimulus that is coming, there is a portion of it, the federal stimulus that is, there is a portion of it at least that's dedicated um, to uh, to highways, uh, to highways and bridges on the highway side, similar to um, what they have done, uh, you know, to on the transit and aeronautic side, which was great to see. So we're hoping for that same um, kind of help, um, helping, uh, you know, all the DOTs across the nation just to get back uh, on their foot and, and to keep on going strongly. All right, Mr. Thank you, that was a good question. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for joining us and uh, we'll definitely, the other questions, we'll forward them to you and we'll get answers to the people who are asking the questions. To keep in the program, we are moving, uh, thank you again, and we're moving now to Erlene Coker. She is with the FHWA. Uh, she is the division administrator and the other capacities she previously served FHWA include Minnesota Division Administrator, Utah Assistant Division Administrator, as well as a transportation engineer. Prior to joining FHWA, she gained valuable leadership experience in serving IDOT for 13 years. And of course, she holds a bachelor degree in general engineering from the University of Illinois. So Arlene, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Akadi, and I, I love that. It really is the University of Illinois. I, you know, I don't know about that thing, but you know, I, I did gain a lot of leadership experience working right alongside the secretary in Peoria on oh that little project through there, rebuilding an interstate. So we had we had uh, we had a lot of leadership opportunities doing that. So thank you very much, Dr. Alcadi, and and thank you, Noel, for. Uh, training me up on Zoom. We'll see how we'll see how this works. So I only have I have I, want, I wanted to cover three topics. I'm going to talk about funding. I want to talk about asset management and just a little bit about innovation. So first, funding. So we are the federal government or federal highways is um, operate well mostly federal government I should say is operating under continuing resolution right now, and that expires on Friday. Um, that continuing resolution also extended the FAST Act for one year. Uh, so at the FY 2020 funding level. So that was a good piece. But of course, we've been watching lawmakers this week and hoping that they would uh, come together on an omnibus package to, to fund um, the government for an extended period of time, at least past um, the end of the year and the... Um, the changing of the administration. Well, it doesn't look like that's gonna happen. So right now the talk with lawmakers is to um, pass a week long extension to fund through next Friday to give them a little more time to uh, get an omnibus bill put together. And you know, if you, if, as the secretary alluded to, one of the things that they are also talking about is doing an omnibus along with a, um, relief package for those uh, states and local agencies who have been affected by COVID. That is, that's a piece that, that wasn't included uh, in the original uh, COVID package, but we're, we're looking, we're hoping, we're seeing talks that the transportation agencies may be included in this next uh, relief package. So 
Right now, it looks like we'll be funded through um, next Friday, and then we'll wait and see. And hopefully, there will be um, some good discussions, and the lawmakers will come together to provide an omnibus plus some relief for COVID for transportation agencies. Um, so, asset management. So, the fir first thing for um, me a division administrator working for Federal Highway Administration is the Transportation Asset Management Plan. You are pro you you may or may not be sick of me here sick of hearing me talk about it, but it's really an important change in thinking that IDOT has really wholly embraced, and we applaud the commitment to that change in philosophy regarding asset management. We were a um, worst first kind of state, and have found over time that that's not necessarily the best way to keep our assets in the condition that we need them to be for our, our users. And so IDOT is, is undertaking a lot of, of um, activities to continue to implement the TAMP. So they're working on changes to the Bureau of Design and Environment Manual to align with the TAMP and giving some guidance on pavement preservation and rehabilitation and reconstruction. They're increasing the focus on pavement preservation, which is new for a lot of us. How does that work? How long does it last? You know, what's the best way to put it down? So there's also revisions to specifications and special provisions for those pavement preservation treatments. So there's a lot of work going on around the TAMP. They're also in the process of revising it to include the funding levels that were provided in the, the capital bill. So the secretary also alluded to um, the IFIT performance testing and Federal Highways is, is in support of that, that specification because what it does is it provides the other end of the spectrum. We have the Homburg wheel for rutting and now we'll have IFIT for to test for cracking cracking susceptibility and it'll put us in a great position to be able to test for longer lasting better performing mixes and IDOT's been a leader in this arena and it's great to, to see this test being implemented the work that has been done um, with ICT and Dr. Alkadi on on this test and actually you know putting it to work out so that we can we can understand the performance of, of our our mixes. Um, the long-term aging protocol will go into effect in 2022, another product from the ICT Research Center, as well as, you know, uh, beginning to allow the use of terminal blended asphalt binder modifiers in 2022, which came out, also came out of Dr. Alcati's research. So there are a lot of great things um, coming uh, forward in, in Illinois that are, that are really going to prove useful uh, to make sure that our assets are longer, la you know, the pavements are longer lasting and um, are durable. So um, the, other, the other piece of that is, so along with the asset management plan came a data quality management program. We have to make sure that the, the data that we're collecting and, and basing our decisions on is accurate and can be uh, validated and verified. And so one of the pieces that um, will support that is IDOT's proposed test track to calibrate, verify, and certify the equipment that IDOT uses and contractors and vendors use to measure and collect the, the pavement data. Um, so we're, support, we're supporting, the, and this will support IDOT's implementation of I, the IRI special provision. Um, the test track is gonna be located along US 50 um, east of Lebanon, Illinois. So that's those are some great pieces that are um, bringing, bringing the asset management plan together in completion. And so just, just to wrap up on asset management, there are also performance measures that are associated with um, asset management. And so we often have and, and joke with our, our colleagues, right? There's this friendly competition between pavements and bridges. The, you know, the pay on the pavement side, we say that, you know, pavement is is the the connected connect the bridges connect pavements, right? 
And of course, the the structural engineers say, well, the 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 bridges are the key. You know, you can't you can't pay you can't have a pavement without getting it across the river, right? So there's that friendly competition. And so with um, transportation performance measures, each of those pieces of the critical infrastructure have measures associated with them. And so um, as part of the TAMP, we look at those measures, the goals that, that IDOT sets and whether they meet them. We have done a pretty good job on, on pavements so far. We did a, a, a mid-year look at, a midterm, I guess, so two years into the TAMP, looked at, um, or not two years into the TAMP, two years into performance, looking at performance measures to check to see how we're doing on pavements. We're doing pretty good when we're talking about the NHS. We're not doing as well on bridges. So as you know, the there's a penalty associated with our bridge condition. And right now, Illinois is one of the states that has the, the penalty imposed. And so while we don't lose any money, um, what IDOT loses is flexibility. So the flexibility and how to spend that money. So um, so I just, just wanted to remind you that while there's a healthy competition and while pavements are doing well, there may be some decisions that have to be made um, to make sure that we can get out of the penalty for, for bridges so that we can use the flexibility that we have in the federal funding to be able to spend that money on the assets that we, we find um, we need versus you know, having to spend them where um, the Federal Highway Administration might tell you to. So just, just a note on that. We're headed, th there, there's so much uh, positive in the area of asset management that Illinois is doing um, that I, you know, I just, I look forward to seeing how all of these pieces that we're implementing will benefit the system and the users. So innovation. So as, as, as it just so happens, the um, every day counts six. We've had six rounds of every day counts, um, which is our, our vehicle to implement innovations that have worked, that have been identified by states. These innovations generally come from our state partners who have um, experimented, implemented, worked through these, um, these innovations, and they're ready to ready for, let's call it prime time, as we would say. So the EDC summit selects um, a, a set of innovations each, each every two years to um, deploy to states to use. It, it's a, um, we provide information, um, some specifications, it, all the things to set up so that states can adopt these innovations. And one of them I wanted to talk about was the targeted overlay pavement solution you'll probably hear it known as TOPS. Um, but what it does, pavement overlays represent a significant portion of the highway infrastructure, right? And, and the dollars associated with that. And so state and local highway agencies can maximize this investment and help ensure safer, longer lasting roadways, all the things we've been talking about, by employing some innovative overlay procedures that'll improve pavement performance, lessen the traffic impacts and reduce the cost of pavement ownership. So that's what um, the TOPS um, EDC initiative is about. And that starts today. So it's, it's three afternoons and it's virtual. Um, I know we're all struggling, although I think, I don't know whether we're struggling anymore with virtual, we're, we're just struggling with the fact that we can't um, see each other and shake hands um, and talk in person, but I think we've done a great job of mastering, delivering so many things that we, we normally do in a big group um, via virtual, but it's being delivered um, the next three days virtually as well. And the nice, I guess the, the upside of virtual is, is I think we can have more people come that may not have been able to come before. Um, so that, so that's a great thing. And and just because I'm a, as being a former specifications engineer, um, I can be a spec geek sometimes, although I try to stay away from it because people don't like me to get in there and meddle with the spec sometimes. But, you know, the new, the new specifications book will be coming out in 2022, and it's going to incorporate a lot of the quality control and performance, um, and the, the pay for performance, quality control for performance, and the QCQA specifications that we've had into the spec book. 
And so we always, as a spec engineer, we always look forward to when we can get all that stuff in the spec book for about three seconds. And then we have special provisions and supplementals that come right after that, because it's the cycle of how we do things. Um, so lastly, just safety. As, as you know, the secretary talked about, and there was a question about um, vehicle miles travel being down for 2020. So it is down for 2020, but unfortunately, the rate of fatalities and serious injuries isn't. Um, you know, as the secretary indicated, we have a thousand fatalities already this year, and and too many of those are in work zones. And so I just echo the secretary's request to remind you and request that you let your friends and families and the people in the checkout line at the at the grocery store. You know, everybody needs to know that, you know, they have to put their phone down when they're behind the wheel. Um, you have to pay attention when you're approaching and in work zones and uh, to move over and slow down for vehicles that are on the shoulder because we all have to make it home each and every night for us to, to reach our goal of zero deaths. So thank you for the opportunity, Dr. Alkadi. I appreciate it. If there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to pass them off to Omer. Thank you so much. That was that was really very enlightening for us. And uh, I will see if we have any questions. Okay. I think there is few. Angeli. Thank you. Um, first question, is IDOT looking at using GPR technology to verify density on the mat and joint like Alaska DOT? I'd say that's a Jim Trepan, your question, isn't it? <laughs> So then I will go, we will go with the second question. We'll defer this. Actually, we have presentation during this conference about this, so we can definitely uh, touch on that. Yep. Yeah, that's more of an IDOT question. All right, Anjali? For the second one, it is becoming more and more clear across North America that pavement maintenance is critical. If a vendor or supplier have solutions for prolonging the life of pavement infrastructure, while contributing to carbon neutrality, how do they get involved with the recent with the research being done with IDOT and the test track? And who is the best contact or best place to start? I'm deferring to you, Dr. Alcadi, on that one. Uh, we definitely, I guess they are talking maybe about the test track that uh, uh, you mentioned. Oh, the US 50 uh, test track? Actually, that's maybe what they were referring to. But if they were referring okay. about the I Act, I'll be more than happy to answer that <laughs> later. So I'll, I'll leave that answer to you and I will answer that. Uh, so I will not take from your time. So, I will <laughs> that later. so yeah, go okay. ahead. Please. Well, that one. Obviously, I, I would say, um, you know, re reach out to the Bureau of Materials and Physical Research would be my. My suggestion, uh, if you want to get involved in in some of that um, research and ideas for the the test track, that's be where I would start, and then they can send you um, to a, to a, a more specific place if if that's or the right place if I'm wrong. Right. As the next question on the chat, what are the chances of a future nationwide capital infrastructure bill for the next year that replaces the Fast Act after the latest extension? Wow, if I knew the answer to that, I would play the lotto today. <laughs> you know, it's, um, the, so, the, so the, the great news is that the um, Biden administration holds transportation um, uh, as important as well. So, so that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're seeing. And, you know, while the lawmakers didn't come together um, soon enough, to, to have an omnibus for um, this Friday. They are actually, I mean, the talks seem to be promising. Again, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, but the, the next administration um, has indicated that they are, uh, they want to work on, on having uh, a long-term authorization. So all of that is pointing in the right direction. The, the, you know, again, the devil is always in the details and how you fund something like that. But, but you know, everything is looking positive for that to happen. So that's, that's our hope. All right, thank you so much. 
Any other questions, Angeli? I don't see any more new okay. ones. Arlene, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being with us as, as always. And thank you for all the support you're doing for our great state. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ahmad. And uh, now our next speaker is uh, uh, Paul Kovacs. It's, it's really my pleasure to introduce the Chief Engineering Officer for the Illinois Tollway. Uh, he is responsible for the policies, practices, and procedures of the engineering department, which oversees all the design and construction operations on the agency's 294 mile system of roadways serving 1.6 million daily users in Northern Illinois. Currently, he's responsible for delivering the Illinois Tollways 15 year, 14 billion capital program, which is Move Illinois. It is the Illinois Tollway driving the future. Uh, Paul earned his bachelor degree from, of course, the University of Illinois. And we don't just give degrees here at the University of Illinois. We even hook people together. So his uh, wife is also a graduate of University of Illinois. He's a registered professional engineer in Illinois and in Michigan. Paul, uh, last year, uh, he received, I think I have to brag and mention this, uh, he received uh, the Opal Award, which is the jewel award of the ASCE. So it's, it's really an honor to have somebody with us today uh, who's the recipient of this award. So Paul, the floor is yours. Uh, you are muted or you're good? Am I on? You're good, yep. All right, hold on. I know I got my screen up. I lost my uh, presentation here. That's okay. One second. There we go, I can see it. Wait. Can everybody see it? Yep. All right. So I think you, you jinxed me, Dr. Alcotti. You start mentioning awards. Now I can't even run my own presentation. It's very <laughs> embarrassing. Hey, but I, I did want to, um, I really appreciate um, Arlene and Omer speaking today. I, I think we underestimate how much it means to all of us to see people. And I, I really appreciate your leadership and keeping things going. Um, I turned to my wife this morning. You know, we we've been we've been in a new routine. You know, since COVID has started, so we go on walks every morning. And I I just turned to her and I'm like, I'm sick of this. I, I really, you know, I don't I don't like this COVID anymore. Let's go back to the regular uh, routine. And we know that's not an option right now. So I I really have grown to appreciate everyone um who is making efforts to keep things going and make things um as good as they can be and and one example is you uh dr alcotti and the illinois center for transportation proceeding with this conference i think that's awesome uh, i was looking back at all the uh, programs uh that you have on your website very good website also um i noticed i've not participated in this conference before so i'm very honored to be a part of this 61 year old conference, one, one year older than me. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, that it goes without saying too, I mean, you have, you know, a hundred, over a hundred, 190, I think I saw participants on this uh, conference, which is, it's just awesome to have that many professionals dedicated uh, to this aspect of our work and also to, um, looking at the latest innovations in asphalt and flexible pavement construction. And also, I don't want to go too much further without saying that I truly want to highlight and appreciate um, my Deputy Chief Engineer, Cindy Williams. She has also dedicated a lot of her service uh, to an expertise in materials and especially uh, asphalt, which is extremely important. 
uh, to the tollway and other transportation agencies because in very technical terms, we use a lot of it. And um, we want to get the best service we can out of it. Um, the tollway processes with warm mix asphalt have definitely been critical to the implementation of our Move Illinois Capital Program. Um, these processes are very fluid for us. We continue to update them based on uh, research, industry trends, best practices. Uh, that's something that's enhanced by joining all of you at this conference and the work that you all do. Um, the tollway is using all warm mix asphalt requirements. We have been doing that for a little while. Uh, and I'm gonna start by just doing a quick overview of the Move, Move Illinois program. So we're wrapping up our ninth year of our $14 billion 15 year capital program. And with respect to uh, spending, we're about halfway. So this Move Illinois program, it's the largest program in the tollways history. Uh, we're making, an, and we see how important these investments are, not only in the short term economic benefits it's producing for Illinois workers, Illinois firms, uh, but also the long term uh, benefits it's delivering uh, to Northeastern Illinois uh, with respect to uh, mobility, uh, creating more long term economic, economic opportunities for businesses that want to do and uh, have people work here and then just in general creating jobs for everyone. So we, we've had a lot of big projects and hopefully you all have been involved in some of them. Uh, one of them is uh, a new toll route, Illinois Route 390, which is gonna feed into the west side of O'Hare. Uh, we're also building the little loop, new interstate loop around the west side of O'Hare, I-490, which we're engaged, engaged in right now. We've already finished um, a 60 mile interstate widening and reconstruction on 990. Um, and we're in the midst of working on probably uh, one of the more challenging projects included in Move Illinois, which is the reconstruction and widening of the Central Tri State Tollway from 95th Street to Memorial up near O'Hare at the north end. And that, that carries our heaviest traffic volume. So that is definitely at a higher level than some of our other projects. Um, and we're also working on completing our new interchange that's going to connect I-294 to I-57. And throughout the work on all these projects and, and corridors within this program, um, our general in goals within the engineering department have been provide quality infrastructure in improvements on time and on budget. Uh, I've also stressed and gratefully had a lot of cooperation from everyone I've worked with on trying to be innovative, take advantage of technology, especially when it can increase safety and efficiency and customer service. The tollway does not receive federal and state tax dollars for its projects. So we pay attention to the people who are driving on the road uh, very closely because we recognize they're, they're paying for everything. Um, and then also we've been really promoting and trying to uh, involve and increase the number of engineering consultants and co construction contractors uh, that do work on our program because we know that kind of growth for our industry and that kind of those kind of jobs for Illinois workers will provide benefits for many years to come. So together with our industry partners, uh, we've been ensuring that our projects remain on, on time and on budget. Uh, we've enhanced overall efficiency. We continue to make improvements, keeping everything in a state of good repair on the Illinois tollway system. In fact, when we complete the Move Illinois program, all uh, original infrastructure within uh, the Illinois tollway, which is, you know, was, was built and opened uh, between 1956 and 1958, will have been replaced. So I'm very grateful uh, for that because that means that the tollway is going to be in a good position to provide service for many years to come. To date, the program has committed 9.5 billion. We've had we've awarded 615 contracts uh, to thousands of construction and professional engineering service firms that are engaged in this program at both a prime and a subcontractor and a prime consultant and subconsultant level. And this, the end result is it's created and sustained up to 89,000 total jobs. 
And even during this COVID pandemic, we're seeing an average of 515 pe people, uh, workers on our job sites every day. Uh, our primary focus right now, as I mentioned, is to work on the I-490 ring road around the west side of uh, O'Hare, and then also the delivery of our widening and reconstruction of the Central Tri-State Tollway. Um, we're fortunate to have a very professional and dedicated team helping us deliver these projects, and many of you are represented in this um, audience today. So like everyone, uh, we've had a lot of challenges put on us uh, due to COVID-19. Um, our usual challenges, and you, and you even heard from Secretary Osmond, you know, about right away. I mean, we, we deal with those on a regular basis, right? Permits need to be obtained. We have to relocate utilities. We have to get right away. We have to enter into third party agreements. And really all those, um, like we don't know how good we had it when we just had those things to worry about. When COVID got thrown in on top of all that, it really, um, it was reason to, um, to panic. And I'm very grateful, none of us did. And I, I am really happy with the way we all responded. Uh, we have continued throughout uh, to deliver our projects, still coming in on time and on budget, uh, which is a testament uh, to all of you guys in, in the industry for keeping that work going for us. Uh, we've also been very strongly committed to continuous improvement. And we've had a culture uh, developed at the tollway of trying to always look for more efficient and effective ways to deliver our projects. And I think that really enabled us to respond quickly with confidence and just demonstrate how resilient we can be. Um, this pandemic did provide us with better ways of doing business. I can't lie. Uh, some things uh, that I had always hoped uh, the tollway would implement and accomplish were, were basically done uh, overnight um, because it's amazing when everyone's faced with the same problem, we, we do come together and we do come up with solutions quickly. So one of those things is just the amount of paper that we utilize at the tollway and uh, for all of our, our processes related to contracts. And every evening at the tollway, uh, since I've been the chief engineering officer, which was back in 2007 when I started, I'd be signing a couple hundred documents every night. Now, they're all coming to me electronically. I cannot say how wonderful that is to have everything organized in that manner and to know where these uh, documents are at at any given time. It's, it's been a great benefit. And I think we gained a, a lot of efficiency. Uh, the tollway also, and a, and a lot of thanks to our uh, folks in roadway maintenance and our also our people in uh, business systems, we converted to open uh, all electronic toll collection basically over a weekend. Um, that is something that I think is a huge challenge for toll agencies to do. And we did it in a weekend, we did it safely. Our customers responded very positively and things have been continuing on that way. And it's been a great benefit to both our workers uh, from a safety perspective and also the public that we're serving uh, from a safety uh, perspective. Um, thankfully, the tollway had a web-based project management system in place uh, before uh, COVID hit. Uh, we utilize eBuilder for a lot of our program uh, documentation efforts. And that kind of just went onto steroids because we put everything in there. And I think you see from this slide, you know, we're processing everything through eBuilder now. We haven't had a great increase in any of our, of our processing times. We, we have, we've always placed a huge priority on paying our vendors for the work that they perform, especially since, you know, they're, they're uh, invoicing us for work that's already done. So um, great turnaround time on our, our contractor pay estimates, 16 days roughly, and on our professional services invoices, it's taken 44 days. So I, I'm really proud of the staff at the tollway uh, across the board for keeping those things going for us and, and showing that, um, you know, we have some resiliency and we're, we, we can meet our commitments. Uh, for an agency as large as the Illinois Tollway is, we still uh, pride ourselves on being very nimble. And I think that flexibility and innovation are key aspects uh, that are helping us deliver Move Illinois in a successful manner. 
our construction specs, they reflect the same uh, resiliency and allow contractors choices in selection of materials that work best uh, for their bottom line while providing the tollway with a high quality product, high quality asphalt pavement. So for many years, the tollway has fostered flexibility and innovation in asphalt mixtures. Many of the contractors here have incorporated those innovations in their work. Uh, the tollway recently completed a research project that reviewed and finalized its performance-based uh, mix design specs. Uh, the goal was to provide contractors with options for their mixes while achieving the performance standards required to ensure a long-lasting asphalt pavement. Uh, the University of uh, Missouri worked in conjunction with the Tollway's technical research panel to establish spec limits to ensure the Tollway can prevent cracking and rotting on its ro roadways. Uh, these new limits have already been incorporated into uh, current special provisions. They're active on our new Tollway contracts. I see Mike Schoke from IDOT will be touching base on similar concept of balanced mix designs later in this conference. Uh, I also want to take a look at some of, the, some of the tollways options for warm mix asphalt design and production. Uh, Contoli, tollway continues to provide contractors with maximum freedom uh, in determining what recycled materials will work best uh, with their equipment and based on their current economics. So fractionated wrap and recycled asphalt shingles continue to provide both to the tollway and the contractor benefits and mix economics and pavement performance. Uh, that freedom extends to the grade of asphalt binder as well as asphalt, asphalt bond binder modifiers to use such as ground tire rubber. Uh, the Tollway isn't the only local agency evaluating uh, these binders. I believe later in the conference, IDOT's Kelly Morse will be uh, talking about evaluations of additives and modifiers used in asphalt binders to enhance performance. So we allow these options because each contractor situation we recognize is different. So rather than um, requiring materials, we permit the contractor to make some choices based on their equipment and the economic out outcome they hope to achieve. Uh, we've always evaluated these innovations with the insistence that long-term performance not be comp compromised. Uh, there's no benefit in allowing these innovations if we have to sacrifice pavement performance. So the asphalt binder modifier options are served by the tollway system for evaluating binder modifiers and rejuvenators. So the system provides suppliers an avenue for having these modifiers approved for tollway construction. Ground tire rubber suppliers have already taken advantage of that system and GTR is used routinely on tollway SMA construction. For years, Chemical companies have produced asphalt rejuvenators. These are used to modify and soften asphalt mixture to achieve the required performance properties. Generally, they're softening the asphalt mix so that the stiffer asphalt binder and recycled asphalt products can be counteracted uh, to achieve the mix test requirements, particularly with respect to cracking. Uh, Toys wrapping up its first two rejuvenator trials and will likely include the product products on its approved modifier list. Uh, we're willing to work with suppliers to evaluate their products to see what can be achieved with increasing uh, mix flexibility. So now uh, that the groundwork has been laid for our current options, let's take a quick look at what's ahead. I think you've already heard me mention this a couple times already in this presentation. The Central Tri-State is going to be our big focus uh, in the years to come here within MOVE Illinois through 2026. Uh, it's the workhorse of the tollway system. As laid out in our MOVE Illinois program, we anticipating hitting several key milestone, milestones on this corridor in the next three years. Uh, the main line section, as I mentioned from 95th Street to Balmoral is roughly a 22 mile section. And we are gonna reconstruct and widen it. Uh, major bridge construction we have underway right now. Uh, we wanted to get those uh, restrictions out of the way uh, so that we can move forward with the mainline work in an expeditious and, and a straightforward manner, especially with respect to our maintenance of traffic requirements. So we just completed and opened our northbound mile long bridge project. So that bridge basically got built over the last year. It's awesome. Uh, totally very proud of that project. It opened uh, late November and we're constructing the southbound bridge now. 
So that's going to be the next uh, thing that we tackle there. And we also recently completed our uh, half of our Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad Bridge project. So that's a that's a railroad bridge that spans the tri-state tollway and has a very restrictive opening. So we first had to build a, a shoe fly bridge uh, to route uh, the rail traffic onto the shoe fly. So that's happened already. It was very critical that that get done on time because uh, the railroad uses a track laying machine. They have one for the whole country. So we had to hit a window uh, when it was gonna be available to us. I'm very grateful that we did that. And um, these major bridge projects are basically setting the stage for our mainline work, as I mentioned, and put us in the best position to deliver that work, um, deliver quality work on that corridor on time and on budget. So on the Central Tri-State Toolway, uh, we are building a truly composite pavement. So it's gonna have an asphalt subbase, which is gonna be placed below the jointed plane concrete pavement, which will then be overlaid with two lifts of SMA. The benefits the tollway sees in the composite pavement is a strong concrete pavement with a renewable, smooth, and quiet SMA surface. When the maintenance schedules requires replacement, you know, for the overlay, all adjacent structures will be at the finished elevation already. So that's going to make our future rehabs yeah, even more efficient. In addition, studies have shown that when you start out with a new composite pavement, uh, the asphalt overlay protects the underlying concrete from pounding traffic in the environment, reducing the need for future concrete pavement maintenance and patching. So we're on a quest at the tollway. We keep uh, trying to push the ideas uh, so that we can deliver more long lasting improvements to our customers, try to minimize the amount of times we have to go out on the road and disturb them uh, with future work. So our materials force Forecasting has pegged the years of 2021 through 2023 as the timeframe for heaviest reliance on our asphalt products. We anticipate nearly 800,000 tons of warm mix asphalt to be used between now and the year 2026 with nearly 200,000 of that allocated for 2021 and 400,000 uh, uh, tons over the two year span from 2022 to 2023. So we're looking forward to working with everyone on that this most important corridor for us. And to date, we have a lot of work going on there already and it's on schedule. And a lot of that is due to the efforts of, as I mentioned, everyone in the audience here today. So with that, I, I also wanted to say, I really appreciate uh, the safety messages delivered by um, Secretary Osmond and also Division Administrator uh, Arlene Coker. Um, that is the most important aspect of the work that we do, taking care of um, the people, uh, the public and our workers. Uh, nothing is more important uh, than that to us. The Tollway recently has been uh, developed a new safety initiative, which is especially important for uh, people traveling on the interstate system in the Chicagoland area. So I know IDOT District 1 had the Minutemen out on the road. We have our help trucks out on the road the most important thing is if you have a breakdown on this high speed roadway, which as Secretary Osmond mentioned, is operating at an even higher rate of speed now than it ever has due to the reduction in traffic out there. Uh, it's really important to stay in your vehicles. Let the professional highway maintainers help, uh, help you uh, handle whatever issue you're having out there uh, in a safe manner. Uh, we've had a rash of fatalities on the system earlier this year, and they were all pedestrian uh, hits. So that's people who are outside their vehicles and do not have an appreciation for um, the high risk environment that they're in at that time. So I, I, we really been encouraging people stay in their vehicles, call 911 or call star 999 in Northeastern Illinois. And we will make sure that someone gets to you uh, we have 24 seven service on our roadway. Uh, we have a state police district, District 15, uh, that serves only the Illinois Tollway. So there will be help provided to you in a very timely manner. So with that, I just wanna say thank you. Uh, I know I discussed a bunch of asphalt technical things that are probably above my uh, knowledge and uh, 
ability to answer quickly, but I do encourage you to reach out to us. As I mentioned, Cindy Williams, I'm relying on her. She's doing a great job for us. Um, I'm, I know she'll be able to get you the answers you're looking for on, on the asphalt side of things. So thank you, uh, Dr. Alcotti. Uh, Paul, thank you so much. I think that's very informative about the work that it's all the great work that you're doing at the Tollway. And I'll turn it to Anjali. We have a few questions here. Yes, for the interest of question, I think we may limit it to this one question on the Q&A um, chat. Uh, so for Paul, on your new specs on cracking, are you bumping up density and testing requirements on joints? Like I said, that's going to be a question that I will get you the answer to, and I'm happy to do it. And I'm going to rely on Cindy uh, Williams to help me out uh, in tracking that down. Okay, we'll, we'll take in this one more question from Jose. Um, he says, thanks for the very detailed presentation. Although this is not in your jurisdiction, but is there any update on the status of the future west entrance of the O'Hare airport that will connect with the new tollway, Illinois 390? So uh, that, that's a great question. And we are seeing a lot of progress on that. And I mean, the complexity and difficulty of that project is at a level that I was not fully appreciating, but I do appreciate now. Um, we are coordinating with two federal agencies, the FHWA and FAA. We are coordinating with uh, City of Chicago Department of Aviation. We are coordinating with two railroads. Um, we've concluded our agreements with the railroads. We're making great progress on the work that we're gonna have with them. We are letting projects uh, um, for that new I-490 uh, interstate and that is on schedule to be fully delivered by uh, the end of the Move Illinois program, which I mentioned 2026. So things are gonna keep moving forward there and I appreciate everyone's patience. And um, you know, it, it is a very complicated and complex project and we're doing everything uh, to, to make sure everybody's on the same page and fully coordinated on it. I, I did wanna mention, you know, um, tollway, so it's been so resilient. All of our 2020 projects and 2021 projects are as scheduled are being delivered. I think this year we put out 1.4 billion in advertised construction work. Uh, there is a reduction in traffic on our system right now and it is roughly um, averaging, our, our passenger vehicles are down 30%, but our trucks are up 4%. So I think you people are ordering a lot on Amazon, uh, getting ready for the holidays here. So I really appreciate that. Uh, revenue overall is only 16% down. So we're doing great so far. I think we just sold uh, 500 million in bonds. So we, we have a full commitment to keep moving forward with our program. And I, I think that's good news for everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paul, again, for joining us. And we really appreciate you being here. And now I'm going to be turning uh, to our moderator, the next moderator. It's uh, Dan Gallagher, who will be moderating the next session as well as the award, uh, uh, the award ceremony. Uh, so Dan is the vice president and chief operating officer at Gallagher Asphalt Corporation. In 1987, he began his career as a plant supervisor. He is actively involved in the industry, serving on the Illinois Asphalt Pavement Association Board of Directors and previously holding the post of chairperson at NAVA. He earned his bachelor, bachelor's in mechanical engineering technology from the great University of Purdue. I have to say it's the great university because you are having uh, Illinois behind you. So I have to do that too. <laughs> Although I believe in that too. So. <laughs> Dan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmad. Um, it's uh, my pleasure now to uh, make an introduction of Jim Chapanier. Jim is the engineer of hot mix asphalt, aggregate and chemical tests at IDOT, Central Bureau of Materials. He is licensed professional engineer and holds a bachelor's in civil engineering from Michigan Technological University. Uh, Jim's been with IDOT for a number of years, and uh, I feel like he's a friend in the industry that we've grown up together. So it's my great pleasure to hand it off to Jim. Take it, Jim. Okay, thank you, Dan. Can you all hear me? We can.
Okay, did you say you could hear me? Yep, we can hear you and we can see your presentation. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Dan. Um, Dan indicated I'm going to be presenting on the IDOT HMA Tech Brief, uh, which is formally known at this conference as the IDOT HMA Update. Um, the, the format will be the same, where it'll be a, a series of very brief updates on a variety of different HMA topics, which this year includes binder usage and trends, HMA and binder research, full lane sealant and full lane sealant waterproofing system, wax modified tax, ICIT implementation, HMA spec revisions, and some miscellaneous topics. So beginning with the uh, asphalt binder usage and trends, uh, if you've attended this conference before, uh, hopefully this is a familiar uh, graph to you, where this shows the usage of our most commonly used performance graded asphalt binders here in Illinois which we have listed across the horizontal axis here. We got PG64 minus 22, 70 minus 22, 58 minus 28, 76 minus 22, 70 minus 28, and all the others are grouped over here with the usage percent on the vertical axis. Uh, we've got a, a, a range of years from the light blue on the left representing 2011 usage to the pink on the right representing uh, 2019. Um, the, the, what I typically point out on this graph is that our, uh, our workhorse binder used to be a PG64 minus 22, but the last year of that is in 2011. There's a, a, a stark decrease in the 64 minus 22, which corresponds with the stark increase in the 58 minus 28 usage going from 2011 to 2012. That's the year we changed our wrap RAS spec to allow higher levels of recycle binders. And with the high level of recycle, uh, when you get over 20%, you need to bump your high and low temperature grade, uh, both down one. So uh, 64 minus 22 became the 58 minus 28. Uh, so moving forward, you probably won't see that. Uh, next year's it'll drop off. So moving forward, it will basically have two workhorses and basically be an equal market share between the 64 minus 22 and the 58 minus 28. Uh, this graph represents the amount of uh, polymer modification we've used in our asphalt over time. Um, we began using polymer modified asphalt back in 1992 and back in the 90s up until I'll say uh, 2009, we used to average about 25% of our asphalts contain polymer. Um, but in recent years, as you can see, we're up in the mid 30s and more recently, uh, upper 30s, low 40s. So the overall average for the range of years here uh, from 2004 to uh, 2019 averages 33%. Uh, this graph represents the bituminous price index. On the vertical axis, we've got the cost of asphalt binder and liquid tons. Um, on the horizontal axis, we've got a range of time beginning with uh, July of 2012 through October of 2020. Uh, this bituminous price index usually follows the cost of gasoline very closely, it correlates very well. Um, in recent years, since mid to late 2018, we've been on a downward trend. And I think that will probably continue because this goes in hand in hand with the cost of gasoline. With fewer people driving, the cost of gas has been down. So I think the cost of asphalt binder will also remain down. Asphalt binder and HMA research uh, timeline. Back in 2017, we began our ICT research to develop the IFIT long-term aging protocol. That work wrapped up in August of last year. In 2018, we began our ICT research to uh, develop an asphalt binder performance test. We need this asphalt binder performance test to allow us to begin using modifiers in our asphalt binders. So the research started in 2018. Um, it is ongoing. There's been a, uh, a delay 
due to COVID, the university had to shut their laboratories down for a period of time. So uh, this work was supposed to complete the end of this year. So this month it was supposed to complete, but uh, due to the shutdown, uh, they had to file for an extension. So I believe the work is, is slated to complete the end of the first quarter of 2021. But uh, Kelly Morse will be presenting on this research in more detail uh, a little later on today. So for 2022, we should have the asphalt binder performance test work completed. So we'll be ready to implement that. And that will allow us to begin allow, uh, allowing modifiers in our asphalt binders. So therefore we'll also be implementing the long-term aging protocol for IFIT in 2022. Uh, brief update on full lane sealant. Uh, Kelly Morse presented on this, I believe, two years ago at the uh, this conference on some experimental projects we did looking at full lane sealant. Uh, full lane sealant is basically longitudinal joint sealant minus the filler. Um, so it's used at a lower application rate all the way across the mat on the experimental projects we did two years ago. Uh, District 2 and 5 both uh, constructed one of these projects where we looked at different application rates of full lane sealant. Uh, we looked at rates of 0 0.15, 0 0.20, 0 0.25, and 0 0.30 pounds per square foot. Um, all of these different rates sections were separated by control sections. So now we're just sitting back and waiting and monitoring the performance. And after two years, we're really not seeing any visible difference between the controls and full lane sealant uh, sections. Uh, all sites are performing well. LGS was used on the centerline joint, so they're holding up well also. And really, we weren't intending to see differences this early on. Um, I'm thinking it's probably going to be another two or three years before we start seeing differences in performance. Full lane sealant waterproofing system. This is a alternate bridge deck waterproofing system, an alternate to section 581 in the standard specs where it calls for the use of rubber membrane and coal tar pitch, um, very labor intensive, uh, time consuming and costly uh, method uh, where we're hoping this, uh, this full length sealant waterproofing system is gonna be a, um, better in all aspects. It uses, uses uh, full length sealant and low permeability statically rolled HMA mixes, um, which are more ideal for use on bridge decks. As with any waterproofing system, it's intended to prevent the ingress of water and chlorides. And um, as I mentioned, we, we think this is gonna be a lot more efficient and cost-effective uh, alternative for constructing. Uh, it consists of five steps. It could be four steps if we knew that our bridge deck was always going to be very clean and very dry to where the full length sealant could stick directly to the, uh, the surface, the bridge deck. But uh, we know that's not always gonna be the case. So we, we have a, a first step of applying a standard tack coat emulsion at a, at a residual rate of 0.05 pounds per square foot. That is covered with the full First application of full lane sealant, which is a, a application rate of 0.25 pounds per square foot. That's covered with a Illinois 4.75 binder mix, which is a, a very stable, low permeability, statically rolled mix, perfect for bridge decks. That's covered with a, an, a second application of full lane sealant at an application rate of 0.15 pounds per square foot. And then Finally, the wearing course, which ideally we would like to be an inch and a half uh, lift of 9.5 SMA, another very stable, low permeability, statically rolled mix, perfect for bridge decks. Now we've done a number of these projects already over the last couple of years. And since the 9.5 SMA was not readily available uh, downstate, a 9.5 fine grade was used on most of those projects. So at this point, uh, for the projects that have been constructed, we're monitoring performance. The uh, chemical test unit goes out and um, gets samples of these bridge decks. They, they drill at pre-designated areas on each of the bridge decks. 
uh, to get down to the concrete in the bridge deck. And at that point, they start collecting the fines from the drilling. Those fines are taken back to the laboratory and tested for chloride contamination. So at this point, uh, the full lane sealant waterproofing system is working well on all sites supplied. Chloride ingress has been stopped and the pavement surfaces are holding up very well, which this is very good news because as I mentioned earlier, that uh, 581 system, it's very labor intensive, it's very time consuming, very costly. And we've tried other systems um, that are also uh, pretty labor intensive. They, they're, they involve multiple steps and they're very costly and they have not performed well. So we're hoping that uh, this FLS waterproofing system is gonna be the silver bullet. Okay, brief update on wax modified hot applied pack coat. We've been talking about this for a few years. Uh, so where we're at with that, we've developed an experimental feature work plan. We've worked with industry to develop a material specification. Chemical test unit has uh, evaluated and characterized these materials. And we've actually tried this on projects in districts four and six last year. Uh, the district six project was uh, constructed first and they did have some uh, mechanical issues with the pressure distributor once they got it going. Uh, they also had a pro problem with I think one or two nozzles that were plugging, but once they got that ironed out, it went down pretty uniformly. But uh, in, in a district four project, as you can see by the photos here, uh, they had a little more difficulty getting it down uniformly. So um, we had a meeting with district four and district six materials personnel and also the supplier to talk about uh, these projects. And the supplier admitted that the, the product was not what they uh, what it was intended to be and that they, they have more, to, more work to do on that. So it's really not ready for prime time yet. So uh, we'll keep you posted as work progresses on this. Okay, moving on to uh, IFIT implementation. Um, I believe I presented uh, the revised implementation goals for 2020 at last year's conference. I think I made you all aware that uh, um, we ended up removing the thresholds on all of our projects this year. Uh, industry had expressed concern to upper management that uh, there were members that weren't ready for full implementation. Uh, we needed another year of collecting data. So uh, uh, for the 2020 construction season, the districts ended up testing all the mixes, uh, both as produced IFIT testing on all mixes and long-term age IFIT testing on all surface mixes for informational purposes only. Uh, we also have a revised goal for uh, IFIT implementation for 2021. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the research for the asphalt binder performance test uh, was delayed, so we didn't have that test ready to go. Since that test wasn't ready to go, uh, we're not going to begin allowing modifiers in 2021. And since we're not going to be using binder modifiers, uh, we don't need the long-term age uh, testing protocol for IFIT for the surface mixes. So we had to kind of in the last minute uh, pull that, that requirement out of the specification, which resulted in an, emer an emergency BDE special provision, which I'll talk about here shortly. So for 2021, we will be testing uh, as produced IFIT testing that will be required for all mixes and long-term age IFIT testing for all surface mixes that'll that'll be tested for informational purposes only. There will not be any uh, criteria or requirements that go along with that for 2021. So for 2022, we should be ready for uh, full implementation. Uh, so the intent is as produced IFIT testing will be required for all mixes. Uh, the asphalt binder performance testing suite will be in place. That'll allow us to uh, begin allowing uh, asphalt binder modifiers. So therefore, we'll also implement our long-term age IFIT testing for all surface mixes. Uh, at this conference last year, I also uh, presented some proposed higher FI thresholds for our premium mixes our SMA and IL 4.75 binder mix. For the yeah. SMA, I, I presented uh, proposed values of 18 for the short-term aged or as produced, 
and 12 for the long-term aged. Uh, in subsequent meetings we've had with industry, um, they expressed concerns with meeting those higher levels. Um, and we looked over a lot of data and we're still confident we can meet them, but we ended up relaxing uh, the short-term age for as produced uh, FI value for SMA to 16 and a long-term aged uh, FI to tw uh, 10. For the Illinois 4.75 binder, uh, that will be 12.0, which is a, an increase. Uh, it's not high enough to really be a, a crack retarder, but our concern was getting it high enough where it's not going initi to initiate cracks. Uh, HMA spec revisions, uh, as Arlene mentioned earlier, we have a new spec book, uh, standard spec book coming out in 2022. Uh, knowing this in advance, uh, we started working with a consultant a couple years ago to uh, accomplish two main things. The first was to uh, revise QCQA to meet uh, federal regulations, and secondly, to bring in PFP and QCP into the standard specs, which would, uh, are, will be added to Section 1030. And once we got into this work with the uh, consultant, we realized that <clears throat> it wasn't just the standard specs that affected a lot of different documents. And while we were in there uh, updating these documents, we updated them also for clarity and consistency. So it ended up, we ended up revising over 40 documents, which includes the standard specifications, special provisions, policy memorandums, procedures in the manual, test procedures, and a design manual. Also, we uh, worked with District 1, and we were able to uh, consolidate the District 1 and statewide RAPRAS special provision. That will also be incorporated into the 2022 spec book and be incorporated into Section 1031. Okay, the emergency DDE special provisions, I alluded to a minute ago. Um, the, can, there's two of them. There's the consolidated wrap RAV special provision that I just mentioned. Uh, that'll be in effect for the January letting. I believe though that's already out with the uh, uh, contract documents for that letting. And also the IFIT special provision. As I mentioned earlier, uh, last minute we had to, since the asphalt binder performance test wasn't gonna be ready in time, we weren't gonna implement the long-term age a protocol for IFIT, so we had to pull that out of there last minute. So we made that change for the emergency special and also addressed another concern that industry had in terms of uh, with the higher FI threshold for 4.75, uh, there's already been some work done with that and those concerns with meeting um, the Hamburg wheel requirements, uh, making that mix a, a little more flexible also ends up sacrificing a little bit of stability. So uh, we addressed that concern by revising the Hamburg requirements. Uh, this is the table from the specifications that uh, specifies the number of wheel passes based on the high temperature grade of the asphalt binder being used. And so for the PG70 and 76 asphalt binders, these are the binders that are most commonly used with the 4.75. We've added a new footnote too, which states that for Illinois 4.75 binder course, the minimum number of wheel passes shall be reduced by 5,000. Okay, some miscellaneous topics. Uh, the first is the PG binder selection table for overlays in districts one through six. I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, we never really implemented this uh, according to SuperPave, back when we adopted SuperPave, uh, we didn't think that we would have to worry about low temperature cracking in our overlays because uh, in an overlay, we typically have reflective cracks that relieve the stresses. But uh, we were involved, participated in a low temperature cracking pool fund study with a number of our neighboring states. And we found that uh, you know we had submitted samples for testing as part of that research and uh, some pavement samples and and found out that we do have uh, low temperature cracking in our overlays. They can actually be very closely spaced cracks, which we didn't realize. So this is something that we've been wanting to correct for a number of years to change the low temperature grade in overlays in districts one through six 
from minus 22 to minus 28. Um, and this is also very timely with uh, implementation of uh, IFIT because this will help us with uh, more flexibility and, and, and pass, meet the requirements of the IFIT uh, test. So what you're looking at here is um, all the, the grades that have been revised in green. By the way, this, this table will be incorporated in the, in the uh, BDE design manual effective for 2022. So the changes, the ones that you see in green, all we did there was simply lower the low temperature grade from minus 22 to a minus 28. Didn't adjust the high temperature grade. The ones you're seeing in red, uh, in those cases, we lowered the high and low temperature grade because uh, we didn't want to go from a 64 minus 22 to a 64 minus 28, making it go from non-polymer to polymer. That wasn't the intent to start specifying polymer in all these applications. So we're lowering the high and low temperature grade. So what we would like to see is uh, for districts one through six is for those districts to over the course of this next construction season to begin uh, specifying the softer grades to, uh, to get ready for 2022 to make sure that you're not gonna have supply issues, make sure you're not gonna have stability issues, so on and so forth. Uh, District six um, has been experimenting with the minus 28s for a number of years now, knowing that uh, that was our goal to eventually switch to that. So, and district two also started doing that last year. So I would encourage them to continue doing that and, and districts one, the other districts, uh, districts one, uh, three, four, five, um, also begin getting some experience with those. Uh, another industry concern with uh, IFIT and performance test period was uh, the requirement where they compact the gyratory specimens from which the test specimens are cut out of. So they compact specimens and supply them to the district. The district cuts test specimens out and then the test specimens are supposed to be within a void range of seven plus or minus 1%. And there's no guarantee of that, especially when you're compacting your gyratory specimens at seven plus or minus one. So there was concerns about throwing out too many tests and having to go back and, and fabricate more specimens. So we did some work in-house and found that uh, we tar uh, target a higher void level, seven and a half plus or minus a half, which that tighter tolerance of plus or minus a half is easier to achieve when you have a, a large 160 millimeter specimen. If you target seven and a half that are test specimens, once we cut those out of the gyratory specimens, will be uh, at the seven plus or minus 1% void range. So remove the requirement there, but have it on the gyratory specimen, a higher target. And even if the, the uh, test specimens are slightly out of that void range of seven plus or minus one, we uh, based on the data we've collected so far, we don't believe that will have much effect on the test results in that void range. Okay, and the last uh, topic I wanted to provide an update on is the Lakeland Quality Management Program training. Um, in the 2019-2020 training year, uh, COVID hit in early spring and uh, they weren't able to complete their test. They had to close down uh, Lakeland College. So, uh, but Lakeland stepped up to the plate and scrambled to put together online training, which they did in a very short period of time. We really appreciate their efforts on that. And they were able to complete the, the remaining uh, spring classes online over the summer months, early part of the summer. So appreciate that effort. And then in uh, the 2020, 20, 21 uh, training season, uh, the training will be online, except for the laboratories. Uh, the laboratories will be held in person throughout the week of training by appointment. And then for the 21-22 training season, uh, that will has yet to be determined. And the last topic on, on Lakeland is recertification. Um, we have been, uh, receiving a lot of pressure from FHWA and 
Asheville over the years because we're one of very few states that do not have a recertification program for our training. So we've been working with Lakeland College and uh, industry to uh, begin developing a recertification program. And where we're currently at with it, uh, it's looking like it'll be a five-year recertification beginning in the year 2022. Uh, there will be online review sessions. Uh, there will also be online tests at the highest level, but with will include questions from lower levels. So, for example, if you you've uh, you've taken HMA level three, you have tested HMA level three, but there will also be HMA level one and two questions mixed in with it. Uh, if you are a five-day aggregate technician or an HMA level one technician, there will also be proficiency tests that go along with that. Um, and then since there'll be such a large number of people that will have to get recertified, uh, we're, we're probably gonna end up making the most recent people that completed the class most recently, the lowest priority and work backwards. So people that have been through the training over 15 years ago, uh, they would be the first priority. And then we would work backwards 10 to 15 years, five to 10 years, so on and so forth. So. With that, um, that's pretty much all I had. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'll try to answer those if we have any time left. And if we don't, um, you can always reach out to me later on using the uh, contact information in the lower right-hand corner of this slide. So with that, um, are there any questions in the chat box? I think we will take uh, one to two questions. We do have um, a question from Puneet uh, Singhvi. He'll ask um, verbally. Uh, hi, Jim. Good afternoon. Thank you for this nice uh, presentation, nice update. Uh, I had a quick question regarding the IFIT data, which I believe IDOT has been collecting over maybe five years, six years. Uh, I wanted to uh, know how does those numbers correlate with field performance? Do we have some data on that? And what range do we see those uh, flexibility indexes for those uh, field performing mixes? Uh, we actually do have a correlation uh, from the uh, R27-161 project where we, uh, we, we, as part of the research, um, we included uh, five active construction projects in the District 1 area in addition to the full uh, their total recycle projects and they found that uh, uh, we don't have the graphs I can pull up here but after after uh, four years we had almost a perfect correlation between the um, IFIT test results and uh, transverse reflective cracking. Um, we unfortunately don't have a, uh, the full depths to be able to look at low temperature that would be a, a hard one to try to capture but uh, yes, we do have excellent correlation between IFIT and field performance. And I believe the report also um, had validated the flexibility index of, I think they said in the report, 8 to 10 uh, were uh, FI values of 8 to 10 were appropriate. Thank you, Jim. We have another question. Will IDOT QMP recertification be required starting in 2022? Or is that still in discussion? Just looking for clarification. Yes. At this point in time, and it's still nothing is set in stone, but uh, our goal is to, to begin the recertification in 2022. And I don't think we have a, a, a goal in mind yet as far as when we have to have the first round completed for everybody. Um, I, I don't know that you know we're gonna get through everybody in that first year. Are there any other questions? I don't see any more. Or actually, there was a previous question that I may open up to the rest of the speakers, uh, just as a last question. Um, why is the test track so far south? You will not see the weather that the northern half of the state gets, um, such as freeze thaw. 
I'm not sure what they're referring to is with the test track, unless that's the uh, autonomous vehicle test track. Yeah, Jim, there is there is a track is is planned for uh, uh, I guess uh, the roughness calibration and so on, and that's going to be built in in the south. So they were referring to a different. Oh yeah, that would be a, a question I guess for for John Singer. I'm not. Right. Um, so we'll ask that. I'm not aware of that. Yep, that's John's question. You're right. And one more uh, quick question from the Q&A. Whose product are you using for the FLS? Whose product? Uh, there's, we had at one point, we had three producers approved uh, of uh, longitudinal joint seal. And as I mentioned, that's the same as uh, full length seal is the same as the longitudinal joint seal minus the filler. So we had three producers that were approved for LJS, but, uh, one of the companies bought out the other. Um, so I think we're down to two. And it depends on, you know, I guess the contractor on who they select, but I believe Asphalt Materials um, and also Seneca are approved. Okay, I think, uh, Dan, I think the floor is yours. Thank All right, you. thank you again. Uh, thanks a lot, Jim. Uh, just recertification, is there any chance that grandfather like me can get grandfathered in and not have to take that test? Uh, <laughs> I don't think I'd uh, do so well. Um, all right, so it's my honor to uh, go into the award uh, um, that we give out each year. Uh, there's four four awards giving, the first one being the Marshall Thompson Student Award. Uh, Marshall Thompson Student Research Award recognizes a student or undergraduate student for his or her contributions to advancing uh, knowledge in the bituminous paving field. This year's award winner is Isaac Said. Isaac uh, joined the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering in 2016 as a doctoral student. Isaac is known for his thinking outside the box and taking tasks to the next level. He did so in leading a team that developed the New Brunswick Pavement Analysis Tool. Isaac builds upon his own experiences and is a keen observer. Isaac, uh, future plans entail pursuing an academic career and becoming a professor in civil engineering where he aims to focus on flexible pavements at Purdue. Oh no, I added that part, but. Uh, congratulations to Isaac. Uh, it's a great honor. Um, I feel like you should hear some cheering or clapping. It's it's a little weird doing this through a Zoom. Um, so, uh, Dr. Ahmad, do we do anything in between or just continue uh, I, on? Yes, we'll continue on. I think uh, Nawal, she will show the okay. award for each person. Right. And I wasn't sure <clears throat> we did not inform any of the people who received the awards. So I'm not sure if they are in the audience. If they are, I think you know, while she was planning to uh, put them as panelists. So we'll just if, continue. Yeah. If we do have their phone number, we could post that and everybody could start sending them text messages. Absolutely. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> All right. So uh, going on to the next one, the Illinois Asphalt Pavement Association Bituminous Innovation uh, Research Award. Um, the Illinois Asphalt uh, Bituminous Innovation Award uh, recognizes a uh, principal investigator or co-principal investigator or research engineer for his or her innovative research aimed at improving the performance of bituminous fields, materials, and or pavements. This year's award winner is John Singer. John is the engineer of pavement technology at the Illinois Department of Transportation. Here, John investigates pavement performance in order to find optimal solutions to maximizing life cycle models and treatment strategies. John has made significant improvements to a number of hot mix asphalt areas in the department. John, we appreciate all your efforts towards this. Uh, we make our living on uh, pavement, so we wanna make sure that we're producing the best and that we continue to be a very competitive product. So thank you very much. 
The third uh, word today is the Barry Dempsey uh, Bituminous Technical Contribution of the Year Award, which recognizes a department or transportation or industry employee for his or her outstanding engineering technical contribution to the bituminous paving field. This year's award winner is Bill Pine. Bill is the Quality Control Director of Asphalt Technology at Heritage Construction and Materials. Prior to his current role, Bill served IDOT and Heritage Research Group for 13 years respectively, where he focused on resolving hot mix asphalt problems. Bill has top-notch expertise, especially with SMA. Bill is relied upon to guide implementation of new mix design concepts, development of specifications, and education of best practices. Congratulations, uh, Bill. Another award for you, well-deserved. Um, it's done a lot for the industry. Uh, and the last one, the, the Model al -Qadi Leadership in Bituminous Engineering Award recognizes a department or transportation or industry employee for his or her leadership in the bituminous and flexible pavement field. This year's award winner is Paul Yerkes. Paul is the Vice President of Technical Services at, uh, for Chicago Testing Laboratory. Here he has provided high quality lab and classroom training for more than 20 years. When COVID-19 hit, Paul stepped up to help keep IDOT's quality control and quality assurance training program moving forward by suggesting a virtual approach. Finding creative ways to administer the content is only one reason for Paul's nomination. It's also his willingness to help maintain the integrity of the program, which ultimately is a benefit to the entire industry. Anybody who knows Paul knows that his heart and soul goes into the industry and to the training program. So congratulations, Paul, well done. With, with that, I guess if we have any of them on, we could uh, put them into a uh, speaker mode. Yeah, I think, thank you, Dan. That's what I was trying to suggest. I think they are all on, so maybe you can go uh, one by one and have them uh, say a word. They're all on the Okay, I'll, I'll start at the beginning again. Is, is uh, Isaac on? Yep. Yes, I'm on. Uh, thank you so much for this award. I feel really honored. I wasn't expecting it at all, so I was just attending the, the conference, and then I saw my name. So I want to thank everybody. Uh, for for this award i really feel oh, very honored thank you so much thank you dr alcati does a very great job of keeping a secret um so then the the next one john i don't, I don't know if you're on john sager okay, i'm not hearing from john so we'll go on to the next one bill pine okay william let's hear it Hi, Dan. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, very surprised with that and, and humbled. I, I appreciate the opportunity to work in our industry and work with IDOT and the FHWA on trying to make asphalt better. And there's a lot of good people in this industry. <clears throat> and I think uh, the students listening, I hope they'll learn throughout the course of the conference that there's lots of opportunities in our industry for them to contribute as well. Thank you. Thank you again, Bill. That's a great job. And uh, last but not least, by any means, Paul. Uh, let's see that smiley face of yours. Hey, Dan. I thought it was weird that uh, everybody was wondering if I was teaching today and when I would be able to, to log on. As much as I like to be at the conference, it, <laughs> it, my text kept going off and I thought, man, something's going on here. But but I want to echo Bill and, and Isaac and John, everybody's sentiment. I'm humbled and honored, really surprised by this. So um, I see that they got my best pictures and they put them up. So I'm, I'm happy about that. And um, super, super honored to, you know, bear an award that uh, has a mod's name on it. That's, that's great as well. Um, just thanks to everybody at IDOT as well and Lakeland College uh, to make that happen. You know, I think we... In, in spite of a pandemic to keep the training going was a major undertaking and we did it in a turnaround of a few weeks and that that's pretty awesome and I'm glad to be a part of it. So thanks to the CTL team as well. Appreciate it. Well, congratulations to all the award winners. Um, it's terrific. Um, now 
we actually go on break for a bit. I don't know if you want to uh, say anything, uh, Dr. Alcati. I think I just want to thank you and the awards committee. You have done an amazing job and you kept it uh, completely confidential. And I, I truly want to thank you for this uh, prof very professional job. So Dan, thank you and your committee. We really appreciate it. So we're gonna have a break now and we will come back. <clears throat> uh, we'll come back at 1.30, but uh, the official start will be at two o'clock, but we will be opening the session at 1.30. So we'll see you then. Noel, do we have anything housekeeping? I don't think so. I think we're no, going for a break. We're good.